بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلات و السلام على سیدنا محمد و آله الطاهرین Dear viewers, this is episode number 14 from a series of lectures about the role of religion in human's life. This episode is dedicated to the role of religion in defense of weak and oppressed people. The religion, as we mentioned already, can play this role to help the oppressed people, uh, people who are deprived from their rights, to defend themselves, mobilize them, and legalize it for them that you can defend yourself and uh, make a kind of organization and device for it, uh, structure for it, how to defend their rights when it is necessary, when it is necessary to take arms and fight people, oppressed people, not to uh, theorize for invaders, occupiers, oppressors to do their injustice in the name of the religion. Maybe some of the false religions or false understood religions play that role, the second role, which is not proper which is not human, it is inhuman. But the first role, to stand with the oppressed, to stand with the people who are invaded and their lands and properties and uh, houses are occupied, to stand with them and strengthen them, uh, this is one of the human rights, basic human rights. And then the religion which plays this role is a humanistic religion is a philanthropist religion and is a good religion. This is a good and positive role that a religion can play in this regard. So what's the role of Islam in this regard? The Islam, a religion of Islam, only legalizes the war in this case. So if you have heard about jihad in Islam, only this uh, liberation jihad is meant. Other types of jihad or so-called jihad are not Islamic jihad. For example, to attack other people, to attack opponent, insect, and uh, um, denomination uh, in the name of Allah, in the name of jihad, kill them, behead them, take their property, evacuate them. No, no, no. These are not jihad. These are not religious. Maybe somebody uses the religion for them, but these are not religious. The only thing which is in Quran is mentioned that you can do it as jihad is this. Quran clearly says that. أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ أَلَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا مِنْ هَذِهِ الْقَرْيَةِ الظَّالِمِ أَهْلُهَا وَاجْعَلْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا and this type of jihad is not special to Islam. This type of jihad existed in other religions also, in Judaism, in Christianity. And this verse which I recited for you is talking about the life of former nations, especially Israeli nations. Israeli nations only were permitted to defend themselves. If they are invaded, and Quran says to the Jews, why you don't fight? Why you don't fight when? Why you don't fight when the oppressed people, they say, oppressed people are explained in the verse. Children, women, and elderly, weak people. Why you don't defend them? And they are crying day and night, Oh God, please take us out of this suppressive city, unjust city. People of this city are not just. People of this city are oppressive, are aggressive. Please take, out, uh, take us out of this city and appoint for us a leader, a commander, a helper, an assistant who can guide us, lead us, organize us, 
and help us to be rescued and saved from this community, from this society which they are suppressing us. So the goals of Islamic Jihad is clear here. The goal of Islamic Jihad is not to occupy uh, more lands or to, uh, for example, extend the territory of the em em empire to make an Islamic empire or Jewish empire or American empire or European empire and uh, make it as much as possible wider and wider, broader and broader. No. The aim of Islamic Jihad is to save suppressed people. Either save the self, if, if the self is self, uh, suppressed, or save the others who are seeking for help. They are asking for help. And you know that they are really suppressed. They are really oppressed. And they are crying to you and crying to God that we are ready for defense. We are ready for, uh, uh, for example, res be rescued from here. But we need only assistants and supporters and protectors. So this is what is called in today's uh, culture humanitarian intervention. Either your, your city is, uh, is occupied or invaded, then this is called in contemporary culture, it's called resistance, resistance movement. Or some of the weak people ask your help, seek for your assistance to be rescued from the oppressors, then this is the real jihad. But unfortunately, today is misunderstood and mispracticed, misrepresented by some uh, insurgent organizations in the Middle East. And because of that, they are uh, supporting that bad image which uh, was preached in the West about Islamic Jihad. Islamic Jihad is a teaching from Quran and from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny, to occupy other countries, other continents. For example, occupy Europe, occupy America, occupy Asia, and force them to become Muslims. This is the false image of Islamic Jihad, which uh, enemies of Islam are frightening people by it. And they are making Islam a kind of danger for the people, uh, an enemy for the people, all of the followers of religions. This is false uh, jihad and false Islam. But the genuine Islam and genuine jihad is to teach you that this is one of your rights, one of your basic rights, human rights, that if you are invaded, you have this right to do the self-defense. This is a positive role that the religion can play. Not to tell you, keep quiet, keep silent, uh, accept the, the invasion, accept the oppression. No, this is bad teaching. The good teaching is that you have right of self-defense, but only defense, not offense, in the name of defense. When somebody wants to kill you, then you can stop that person. And prevent him from killing you, save your life, save your soul. When somebody wants to take your house, prevent him. Or even if he took it, you fight him back and take your house back. This is the basic right which exists in all of the civilizations, in all of the cultures, And for sure, the religious culture, uh, the religious civilization should contain this right for people uh, who are oppressed and who are aggressed. This is the role that uh, uh, the religion can play. And we find that uh, th th this role is played by religions, for example, by Islam, by Christianity. We had, uh, for example, liberation theology in South America. We have real jihad resistance for Palestinians, for Lebanese, for others, for the, the Muslim countries which were colonialized. Uh, by the Western countries, for example, Algerians were able to um, liberate their country from the occupation of France by this belief from Islam, jihad. Iraqis were able to occupy, to uh, re, uh, re, uh, um, take back uh, the, their country 
released their country from occupation of uh, British people by this idea. Even Iranians, they used this uh, teaching, this belief, to cope with the occupation of Russians and the British people in North and South of Iran and many, many countries. So, and this is a good teaching from the religion. This is a good role from the religion because uh, this is helping people to gain back their rights, especially uh, masses, especially nations, ethnicities, uh, communities, uh, which they are experiencing occupation or aggression from the superpowers and enemies. And this role was played by the ancient prophets, like Prophet Moses. Prophet Moses was able to rescue nation of Israel from Egypt in the time that Egyptian people, especially the government, especially the head of government, Pharaoh, was uh, aggressing them and suppressing them, mistreating them, treating them with injustice. So um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this decree to Moses and his brother Harun, as I told you in former sessions. And then uh, Allah told uh, Moses to take the nation of Israel out of the Egypt. And asri bi ibadi laylan innakum muttaba'un take my nation, my servants, out of Egypt and you are followed by troops of Pharaoh, but I will defend you and destroy them. And this happened. And even Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, especially in his last days of life, he was preaching his uh, companions, disciples, to do the defense. And even as it is told, Prophet Jesus himself, he participated in some of the defensive wars uh, for Jews because Jews in that time, they were uh, suffering from occupation and colonialization of their land where they were living because Romans, Greek people, they occupied their land and they were mistreating them. So in that time, the religion played this role. In the time of Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ, and in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know that uh, some of the operations which were, which were uh, done after the Prophet uh, were also continuation of the defense. Uh, for example, when they invaded Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, these areas were Arab populated areas, Arab dominated areas, Semitic dominated areas, but for centuries and centuries were occupied by Romans and Greek people. So they needed for help to uh, kick out these occupiers and superpowers from their territory. So Muslims helped them to do this. And for example, uh, Iraq also, it belonged to Iran, but Iran was mistreating in that time, Persian Empire was mistreating Arabs of this area while they wanted to live in peace and cooperation with Iranians. But some of the kings of Iran were mistreating Arabs of this area and this era. So Muslims helped them. And in the time of Prophet himself, peace be upon him and his progeny, in life of the Prophet, the war which happened between Muslims and non-Muslims, all of the war and conflicts were defensive and were for unification of Arabia, Arabian Peninsula. The glorious prophet of Islam did not attack any other country, neighboring countries in his life. All of his operations, which are called Ghazawat, he led them, commanded them directly, and those who uh, were under his supervision, but he sent troops for the operations, which are called Saraya, they are about 120. All of them were defensive. Even he did not start the defense very early. He started it very late. 
for example, 13 years of mistreatment and torture and oppression from uh, pagans and uh, idol worshippers and polytheists happened in Mecca, he did not issue for them any permission to defend because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal it to him. But when they migrated to Medina and established the city-state of Medina and government of the Prophet, after some months, the first verse of jihad was revealed to the Prophet. And in this first verse of jihad, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes on the defense and defensive nature of Islamic jihad and says, أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Allah says, يُقَاتَلُونَ Those who know Arabic and Arabic grammar and literature, uh, rhetorics, they know that يُقَاتَلُون means those who are offended. Those uh, who did not start the war. They are not offenders. They are, they are defenders. And the war started from the enemy's side and imposed upon them. This is the first reason for defense and permission for defensive war. The second reason, even this uh, defense is not in the situation that they are oppressors. They are oppressed. The war is unjustly imposed on them. They did not mistreat others and provoke them and cause for the war. The, the enemies are cause of war. They want to either impose their ideas and religion upon the Muslims or they want to uh, occupy uh, they, they want to occupy their territories or they want to take their properties so uh, Muslims are oppressed war is started by the enemy they are oppressed and uh, uh, it is possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them and uh, make them win the war so they have all of the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put under their disposal like warriors, combatants, weapon, and organization, and tactic, and everything. So when they have it, and they can uh, get rid of the oppression and aggression, so it is necessary, it is obligatory. Not only it is permitted, but even it is obligatory to uh, get rid uh, from oppression. This is the religious war and jihad in Islam. Not to attack on other cities or countries and take their properties and look for usurp and um, power and wealth in the name of religion. No, never, never. So this is the role, the positive role, the real role, the genuine role which the religion can play in the field of security and defense. So the different wars, at least three types of war are uh, permitted in the religion. One is this, defense. Another one, against those who uh, make a th a th a threat for the security of the people of the country. And another one, those who are out of the law. They are uh, rebellions against the law. So we call them jihad al-difa, qital al-ahl al and qital al uh, So um, all of them are for justice, in behalf of justice, and for security, and for the benefit of the society and human being, not against it, not to impose, um, and even not to start the violence. All of the violences and injustices are sta started by the enemies or by uh, certain powers and forces. Um, this was not under control of the religion, but now religion comes to control the violence, minimize it, and even stop it and destroy it. So this is the role, the real role which the religion played and should play in the life of mankind. Thank you very much for your patient listening and God bless you, peace be upon you and with you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.